Hello Mishpocha, it's Courtney, America's Jewish Mother. Welcome back to my channel. Um, I'm here today to confess that I am a professional gatekeeper. Now, there have been a lot of discussions on BookTube in recent weeks about objectivity versus subjectivity and book snobbery and elitism and even about gatekeeping. And I'm going to weigh in because I have opinions. So, um, so what is gatekeeping? So the internet defines a gatekeeper as someone who controls access to something, much like a bouncer at a nightclub, um, or someone who controls access to a certain category or status. So how then am I a gatekeeper? So if you've been following my channel for any length of time, you've probably heard me say more than once, that I teach college level English. Um, and in this role, I am a gatekeeper in terms of what is considered important or significant works of American literature, because that is my broad area of expertise. Um, and then also in courses like, um, in courses in American literature that I teach, like African American Lit, Multicultural American Lit, American Lit 2, which covers 1865 to present, um, those are mainly the courses that I teach in this particular area at my job. So as a result, I am keenly aware that every text I include on the reading schedule for my literature courses in a given semester sends an implicit message to my students that these are the texts that are worthy of study. This is the literature that is important. Um, so in other words, my role as an educator makes me a gatekeeper of what is considered American literature. Um, and also to a certain degree, what makes it into the canon nowadays. So, does this make me a snob? Yes, yes it does. <laughs> the very nature of my job requires me to set texts against one another in order to judge which ones are worthy of being taught in the classroom and which ones are worthy in terms of study in my, in my research. Um, this is an inherently judgmental role. It does not mean that all of my opinions are completely subjective. It also does not mean that there is no criteria that I'm using to make these judgments, but make no mistake, there is judgment involved. So, am I then judging you, fellow booktubers and commenters, based on your reading? No, I am not. I do not care what you all read. People read for different reasons, and I also don't exclusively read literary fiction, so I definitely understand why people would enjoy the predictable structure of fantasy or romance or mystery or western or thriller or whatever. Um, and I also understand why people would like comforting familiar characters in a genre fiction series. For example, when the Capitol riots happened back in January, I immediately reached for the next book in a spy thriller series that I've been working my way through um, as a sort of escapism and comfort. Um, and then sometimes I also like to use genre fiction as kind of a buffer in between reading heavier and more serious literary fiction. Um, so no, I do not judge you on your reading. I only care whether the students in my courses are reading literature. Especially because I teach sophomore level survey courses and the vast majority of the students who take my literature courses are taking their, their last required literature course of their entire college career minus the very, very small few who go on to major in English. So most of the students who take a literature course with me are taking the last literature course they will ever teach. Uh, the, sorry, they will ever take. So yes, I absolutely care what they are reading in that class. Um, so how do I choose which text that I put on the course schedule? So I have a personal preference for shorter texts when I teach short stories, plays, novellas, poems. Um, and this is really for a few reasons. So first of all, teaching shorter texts enables me to fit more things on the schedule overall so I can cover more ground, which is definitely useful in a class that's supposed to survey American literature from 1865 to now, or all of African American literature. Secondly, if students don't like or engage well with a particular text, well, we've pretty much moved on within a class period or two to something else that they might respond to better. So they don't feel like they're stuck with a text if they don't like it. Um, and then finally, my last reason for liking in general to assign shorter texts, although I do occasionally assign novels, by the way, um, is purely pragmatic. So I have found that when I assign shorter texts, students are more likely to do the reading. 
And yes, I give them reading quizzes regardless of the length of text that I assign, but nevertheless, they are likelier to do the reading if I don't ask for too much of a time investment from them. And if they then do the reading, we have better, richer, and more in-depth in-class discussion. So there you have it. Um, so in terms of which authors and texts I assign, I usually try to go for breadth in my courses. I like to cover as many decades and literary movements as I can. Now, obviously, in a course like, say, African American literature or multicultural American lit, diversity is kind of built into the focus of the class. Um, so then I try to assign writers and movements that I think are either particularly good or if I don't, if I don't personally love them, they're noteworthy for some other kind of reason. Um, so in a typical semester of, say, African American literature, which I'm going to teach again in the fall, um, I will start with the poetry of Phyllis Wheatley and George Moses Horton. I will then move on to anti-slavery rhetoric from Sojourner Truth, Henry Highland Garnett, Frederick Douglass. Sometimes I put in um, something from a slave narrative, sometimes not. Um, then I cover turn of the 20th century writers like Charles Chestnut, W.B. Du Bois, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Harlem Renaissance figures like Langston Hughes, Claude McKay, Nella Larson, and Zora Neale Hurston. Um, I then cover literary naturalism in figures like Richard Wright and Lorraine Hansberry. Um, the Black Arts Movement uh, and figures such as James Baldwin, Amiri Baraka, Paul Marshall, and Toni Morrison. Um, Afrofuturism, where I might teach something like Octavia Butler's novel Kindred and maybe a short story from someone like Nettie Okorafor. Um, and then finally I like to end with a one-act play by contemporary playwright Lynn Nottage um, and an excerpt from Claudia Rankin's volume Citizen. So this, I hope, gives the students a good sense of the arc of African American literature over time. In a course like American Lit 2, so 1865 to present, I try to pay special attention to the diversity of the writers that I include because I really don't want my students coming away from American literature thinking that American literature is mostly dead white men and maybe a few dead white women. Um, so I will typically, so I, I literally will count at how many white versus people of color uh, writers that I've included on the course schedule. So I try to keep it about even, although this is not always possible to do. And I also try to include people from a wide variety of backgrounds. So in the American Lit 2 course that I am slated to teach over the summer, um, I have included white, African American, Jewish, Latina, Asian, and Arab American writers. Um, it's not a perfect system. So for example, in my summer class, I have not managed to include any native writers. Um, and especially in a course like American Lit 2, which for some reason I only teach American Lit 2 over the summer. That's just how it works out. So I either teach it on a short, like six week schedule. So it's either first session or second session. Um, as it so happens, this summer I'm teaching a full summer term course, but even that's only nine weeks as opposed to a standard semester, which is a 15 week course. Um, so especially in a, in a course that's shorter than the, the full 15 week semester. Um, I think sometimes it can feel a bit tokenizing, but I would rather they read at least one writer from these backgrounds than none, especially, again, since the vast majority of my students are white and not English majors. So who knows if they are ever going to read anything by these writers again. Um, so in American Lit 2, I have standard canonical authors that I include on the schedule like Mark Twain, Gertrude Stein, Hemingway, Faulkner, O'Connor, Hughes, Hansberry, and Wright, alongside less commonly taught but still significant writers like Tony K. Bambara and Sandra Cisneros, Hodgin, Lucille Clifton, and Evelyn Shacker. Um, so there you have it. This is what I do as a gatekeeper of American literature. Um, I can't speak for what other teachers do in their classrooms, but hopefully I've at least given you a sense in this video of what I do and why I do it that way. So if you have questions or comments about anything I've said, please do let me know down in the comments below. Um, thank you for watching this. I hope everyone is doing well and staying healthy. I hope you're doing good reading whatever you're reading. And until next time, would it kill you to call your mother?